Hey guys, welcome to the wrap up of my Atmos Theater install experience. Today I'm going to talk to you mainly about the differences and how to use the NVIDIA Shield current 2017 version versus the Apple TV 4K, their current top of the line product. What they are, what I'm using them for, how you might want to use them in your theater, some of the limitations of both. I'm going to compare the experience and that kind of thing. Now this is primarily going to be about streaming local content movies. There are many other things that you can do, especially with the NVIDIA Shield, but also the Apple TV 4K, such as gaming, but I'm not going to get into any of that because I'm not using it and I can't speak to the exact experience. However, what I can tell you is that if you want the ultimate streaming home theater, if you have Blu-ray rips or any kind of local files that you want to watch in your home theater and you want to stream them instead of use a physical disc, you need both of those in your system right now. They're very similar, I have to admit. Um, you're definitely going to prefer one over the other. If, like me, you have both, you're going to be nodding your head throughout this whole video. If you've only got one and either don't have experience with the other or maybe you've just used it as, at a friend's house, you're not really going to get all of this. But I'm going to try to be fair. And I'm going to say up front, I'm not a fanboy of any brand whatsoever. I'm a PC guy through and through. I hate Mac OS. I can't stand using a Mac computer. But... I love Apple phones and I love Apple tablets. I love the Apple TV 4K. I've had Apple TVs since the very first version. For consumer content driven devices, I love Apple. I've had a bunch of Android stuff. I still have a bunch of Android stuff and I don't prefer it for simple content consumption. But then again, I'm using these things as tools, as appliances, and I'll get into that in a second. But for example, my phone, I run businesses, I need to make sure that my phone is going to do everything that I need it to do every single time without any thinking about it, any glitches or anything like that. And every single time I've had an Android, there's always been at least one thing that, oh man, you know, I, I wish it didn't do this or, oh, it's got this bug or the Apple didn't do that. And that's just the way it is because it's such an open source environment. There's just no walled garden like you have with Apple. Anyway, I'm, my point is I own everything. So I'm not loyal to any particular operating system or brand. I simply want to have and use whatever the best is for that particular tool. I don't care what brand it is. If there was a new set-top box that came out tomorrow that was better than both the Shield and the Apple TV 4K. Maybe Roku comes out with a new one. Maybe freaking Amazon comes out with a new Fire Stick and it does everything I want it to. <laughs> buy Apple, buy NVIDIA, I don't care. Just give me the best. So, without further ado, here's my experience with setting both up. Now, if you watched my video where I set my buddy up at the home theater a couple months ago now, he set up with an Apple TV 4K, no, it was a regular Apple TV, but they both do the same thing. And he had an Android phone. He didn't have an iPhone, didn't have an iPad, and uh, didn't even have a computer at the moment at his house. So we were stuck because you can't set up, you can't use an Apple TV without first setting up two accounts, an iTunes account, which is now defunct. They've since killed iTunes. So I don't know exactly how that works, but then you have to set up your Apple Store ID. And he didn't have either one of those. I had to literally download the iTunes program onto my laptop, which luckily I had brought with me, just to create him an account. So that was a big thumbs down for the Apple experience. The NVIDIA experience, however, much better. The process was about the same, but you can go through everything right on the Shield, just using your remote, or if you have an Android phone or tablet, much like Apple, if you have an iPhone or iPad, you can use those as keyboards. So it makes it so much quicker to type in your email address and your password and get everything set up. Now, Apple has a feature where if you have a 
iPad or iPhone on your local network and you're under the same Apple ID that you're setting up, it can just, with one login, psh, set everything up and be up and running without any of the start screens or anything. So I didn't have that going on. Uh, I didn't fire up my Android device for the Shield, so I don't know if it did that. But setup was a breeze. As soon as you log in with your account, either create a new one or log in, I logged in with mine, it immediately updated its OS. And here's where we came to the first problem. Now, the major difference between the Apple system and Android. Apple is what's called a walled garden. Every piece of software that you can install on, an, uh, on a Mac, an iPad, an iPhone, uh, an iPod, or an Apple TV has to be fully vetted through Apple. You can only download and only install things directly from Apple, from the Apple store. So everything in there, they've checked out, supposedly, right? But the point is, they're all supposed to work. And for the vast majority of them, that's the case. You can be confident that you can install something and it's gonna work exactly as you expect it to. M the vast majority of the time. Not so at all with Android. <laughs> you have hardly any kind of vetting program because it is wide open. You can install any piece of software from anybody through various ways on any Android device. So it, it's not going through, there's no such thing as an Android store. You have what's called the Google Play Store where you can download things, but pretty much anybody can put something up on the Google Play Store. It's not a safe zone like the Apple Store. And then you can install things yourself. You can install things from other stores, other repositories, other websites. You know, it's wide open. So stuff can go wrong, but that's just the main difference between the two. And here's where that comes into play. If you're a, especially a younger person, especially a techie person of any age, where you've grown up with this stuff, especially if you've grown up with Androids since the beginning. You know, they're about a decade old right now, I guess. Uh, my wife had one of the very first ones that came out, that old Android phone with the mechanical keyboard that slid. She's, she's a big techie person and she gets pretty much any flagship that comes out, uses it for a few weeks and sells it. That's her hobby, that's fine. So a lot of Android and a lot of uh, Apple products flow through here. But the point is, if you're used to that, the Nvidia Shield is going to be a pretty natural environment. If you are an Android only user and you go to an Apple, especially like the Apple TV product, you're gonna feel like, man, where's the rest of it? This is simple, this is missing stuff. But it's not that. Here's the big difference. When the Apple TV comes on, powers up, and updates its OS, it's called tvOS. You've got Mac OS on the computers, iOS on the phones and tablets, and then tvOS very similar, and it's very similar on the Android side. You have a flavor, a version of Android running on the phones, tablets, and set-top boxes. So when the Apple tvOS updates, you have one place in the settings that says, oh, your system needs an update, update now, does its thing, reboots, and you're on whatever version. I believe they're on 12 or 13 right now, I haven't even paid attention, but it's called tvOS 12, right? And that's it, you're done. Everything is updated. Not so at all with Android. This threw me for a loop and was frustrating the heck out of me. So I get the Shield set up. It immediately updates to the latest version of Android. I don't even remember what it said. I think it's Oreo, I'm, I'm not sure. But it updated to the latest version. Okay, it rebooted, came back in. By default, Kind of like, uh, you know, a lot of phones and laptops, they install a lot of junk. And some of it you can't uninstall. So the home screen, what they call the home screen, was just filled with crap that I am never once going to use. You know, uh, watch these videos and here's some news headlines and it, it 
pre-installed Netflix and YouTube and you know a whole bunch of other apps that I have no interest in. So I uninstalled what I could and luckily there's at least a feature to unpin from shortcuts so it doesn't show up on your home screen for the rest of it, okay? But the Apple TV at least gives you ability to uh, uninstall things and doesn't load you up with junk. If you want Netflix and YouTube and Prime and all that kind of stuff, you have to say install, okay? The installation program uh, process for both is fairly similar. You go into the Apple Store on the Apple and the Google Play Store on Google. Both have a search feature, both have a, you know, hot apps, these are popular, whatever. And it's one click to install and you're done. So that works great. Uh, one thing out of the box that's kind of missing on the Nvidia Shield is with the Apple, no matter what app you're in, on the remote, you can just hit the menu button, which is like back on the NVIDIA Shield. And you can go back to the home screen of whatever app you're in. And then if you hit menu once more on the Apple, it takes you back to the home screen of the Apple TV. So you could switch apps. Well, not so with the NVIDIA Shield. You hit back on here, you have to specifically quit the app to get back to the home screen. So it's just clunky. Now I fixed that because I don't use individual remotes. I painstakingly, and I'll go through this in a second, have everything working through my Harmony remote system. And I custom mapped a button to a dedicated home button for the Nvidia Shield. So with this, I can anywhere inside an app immediately go back to the home screen. And on the Apple, all you do is hold down the menu to immediately go back to the home screen no matter where you are in an app. So out of the box, these have pluses and minuses. I'll be going through remotes. By the way, it's a win for the shield, but neither one is perfect. So here's what I ran into. Like I said, with the Apple, one click to update the OS. Android, it appeared to be the same. Updated, rebooted, started using it. Well, I started immediately testing in Plex. I installed Plex, which is the movie streaming app of choice on the NVIDIA Shield. There's also Kodi. Don't suggest it for streaming local media though. Get to that in a second too. It's gonna to be a long video. <laughs> so, played the uh, first few movies just fine. Atmos was working, cool, doing exactly what it should. Things were coming through in HDR10. Life is good. So I threw on um, Mission Impossible Fallout, which is one of my higher bitrate Blu-ray HDR, uh, uh, UHD rips, right? And it was pushing 47 megabits a second. Not topped out by any means. I have some that are pushing 60, but this one had uh, two soundtracks. It had the Atmos soundtrack and the regular 5.1 which was in Dolby Digital, and then it had like 20 subtitle channels, layers. And it was stuttering. It was buffering after about a minute and a half from the start of the movie. You get a pop-up on the NVIDIA Shield, from the NVIDIA Shield on the TV that says, your network connection is too slow. And after a few seconds, it would catch up and play, and then after another minute, it would buffer, pause, well, the Apple TV doesn't do that. I'm on complete Wi-Fi, by the way. I'm, neither one is wired Ethernet. I do have Ethernet, but it's all tucked back in the wall. I don't use it anywhere in the house. I have one Ethernet wire connected from my desktop computer to my uh, Google Wi-Fi hub right next to my desk there. And that's only because I don't have Wi-Fi in my desktop tower. So I just plug it in, it's there. Each Google Wi-Fi node has an ethernet port if you want to wire something in. So anyway, playing any rip I have, no matter how high the bitstream, the Apple TV plays it. Full quality, no buffering, no stuttering, nothing. Directly from my Plex server, going, well in this room it's two hops away through two Google Wi-Fi nodes, 
No problem. I have the boxes next to each other in the cabinet. They both have full signal. They're both on the same network. You know, everything's good. But the NVIDIA Shield was buffering and it was driving me absolutely mad. So I thought, well, it could be the networking capability of the NVIDIA Shield. Although I installed the speed test app, which is the same one you can run on your phone, tablet, or desktop, and that measures your internet speed. So it is measuring my Wi-Fi speed and then out to the internet. Well, it was, you know, beyond anything I would ever need. Same as if I were testing from my tablet or phone. So it wasn't the physical networking of the NVIDIA Shield that was limiting it. So that means it must be the operating system and or the app I'm using. And I had run into that before on the Apple TV. When I was using the Apple TV, or when I am using it, I use a program called Infuse. And that's my streamer of choice, my interface, because it's very beautiful. It looks just like the Kaleidoscape system. And you pick your movies and play your movies through it. And it plays any file, I mean, any file. The only thing it doesn't do, and it's a limitation of the Apple TV 4K, not Infuse, is it doesn't pass through Atmos because Apple has limited that to just Netflix streaming, Amazon streaming, and uh, Apple movie rentals. They've, they've said, if you want Atmos, you gotta use one of these three things. So they don't allow Atmos pass through, at least not now. They might in tvOS 13, we're crossing our fingers. So the NVIDIA Shield has no such limitation and I'm using the Plex program. Works great, I run a Plex server. But I had run into a similar buffering problem using Infuse when I was connecting to my computer, my server, with SMB, which is a file sharing protocol. And no matter what I did, no matter what settings I tried, I would always have this buffering and lag trying to play anything until I installed Plex server and then served to infuse from my Plex server. The Plex server has its own networking sharing protocol and it's a lot faster than SMB, which Windows uses. You could also use FTP or DLN DLNA so if you have a NAS box, for example, those two are very popular protocols. Long story short, SMB is speed limited and using Plex all of a sudden completely cured it. So the Apple TV directly connecting to Plex, A-OK. -okay. The NVIDIA Shield directly connecting to Plex, not A-OK. -okay. So there's something there that was limiting me, pulling my hair out. So finally, I dragged out my emergency ethernet wire that I have as a backup when I'm doing live shows in case, you know, the Wi-Fi system goes down, I can hardwire right into the router. So I strung it from my office in the front of the house, all the way back here, plugged in the shield. Everything's perfect. Beautiful. Instant play, instant scrubbing, zero buffering, no matter what I threw at it. Okay. So I'll just have to wire back into ethernet. So I went to the hardware store, got some new face plates because I had blocked up everything when I moved in and renovated, never needing ethernet. And I was gonna, you know, uh, rewire my patch cable that I've got in the master bedroom here and do the same in my office and just wire into the NVIDIA Shield. Not a huge deal. So I'm filming a video update and right in this part of the conversation showing what's going on and I'm playing the movie expecting that little message to come up your network is too slow and it plays fine can't get it to fail no matter what I do didn't touch a thing not a single thing what had happened was <laughs> all of the background apps that are part of the operating system updated overnight and it had rebooted. And this is the big difference that this whole long story was getting to. With the Apple TV, you update the OS in one spot and you're done. With the Nvidia Shield, you update the OS 
And that's the tip of the iceberg. You then have to further go into the Google Play Store and you'll see all the apps that you have installed. And even if it's a blank machine that you just plugged in, you've got 20 or 30 apps there that have to update. Some of them are just helper apps that the OS is using where Apple rolls everything into the OS. You don't see any of that, but you do with Android. So there was a whole bunch of stuff that not only had to update once, but more than once, because I had done that when I first plugged it in. Updated it, went through the store, it updated, I don't know, 22, 24 different apps. It rebooted itself, just like a tablet or a phone. And that's when I was you know, running into problems still. Well, it went through another round of updates, sometime overnight, and poof, it just started working as it should <laughs> on Wi-Fi. So I took everything back to the store. Hey, it saved me 50 bucks in, you know, parts. So I'm not complaining about that, but yeah, that's a tip. If you get your shield, update, reboot, update again, reboot again. This thing has glitches until you get it really updated and really steady and rebooted. But after that, I'm happy to report that it's working fine. The Plex app is the same on the Apple TV versus the NVIDIA Shield, also very similar to Infuse, and it just works as it should. Now, let's talk about remotes really quick. The Apple TV remote kind of sucks, I have to be honest. This bottom is just glass, doesn't do anything. The top is touchpad. It's just a matte finish, and it's like a tiny little touchpad for a laptop. So you're expected to use your thumb, and it's also a click. There's a tactile click underneath it, exactly like a miniature laptop. And then the buttons are almost flush, with the exception of the menu, which has a raised ring that you can feel. All of the other buttons have a slight dimple, but they're almost flush with the actual remote, and it is wafer thin. It is very difficult for someone with my size hands to comfortably hold this and keep it in a good spot while your thumb is trying to manipulate things. It's just not ergonomically great. It looks pretty and that's it. Now, like I said, luckily I don't use the remotes, but if you do, it's something to consider. Harmony, by the way, awesome once you get it set up. Nightmare to set up, but awesome once you do. The Nvidia Shield remote is a joy to use. It is slightly bigger. It's not wafer thin, but it's still very thin. It has a slight curve to it, but it's just chunky enough. You can see it's the same width, but it's got a curve to it and it's longer. And that extra length is what really makes a difference because now I can hold it and it sits in the palm of my hand and my thumb naturally falls right on the buttons where the apple with it down in my palm the buttons are below my thumb and I'm having to crank my thumb down. To, I can barely hit the play button. So big difference. You can see how far down the buttons start on the Apple compared to where they are on the Nvidia. Big difference. They're also much more tactile. They're rubber coated. You have this giant okay button or select button in the center that has a slight dimple. And then this outer ring is also a directional. So instead of a touchpad up at the top, Apple makes you swipe, all right? So if you want to can go right, you have to swipe your thumb. It's really annoying. With the NVIDIA, you just tap right, like a D-pad. Works fantastically, much, much better solution. This big button here is for your Google Home. So I can hit this and say, okay, Google, and you know, do that. I like Alexa, she heard me. I like her better, <laughs> so that's primarily what I use, but I do have some Google devices. I just don't choose to use them. And then you have your uh, back or play and stop buttons, which are used differently depending on the app you're in. So definitely a win. Oh, and here's a funny story. I'm playing movies and you know tweaking things, getting things set up and whatnot, and I'm, I'm randomly seeing this message. I don't remember exactly what it said, but it was something to the tune of, 
this device is set to control volume by your receiver. Please use your other remote. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why this message is popping up. Long story short, <laughs> the NVIDIA Shield remote is touch sensitive right here in the middle. There's no button or anything. It's just, it looks like part of the plastic, but it's touch sensitive and it's a volume control. So instead of the up and down buttons here on the Apple remote, all you do is slide your finger up and down right here. While I was hitting it with my, my palm accidentally, just holding it here and not realizing that that was even there. Luckily, there is a setting to disable it in the NVIDIA Shield. You would only use this if you were outputting audio directly from the NVIDIA Shield. If you're going through a receiver, you want to set that to what's called a fixed volume, and that disables the remote volume control because you would never use it. <laughs> so that was funny. Uh, neither the Apple nor the NVIDIA give you any kind of instructions worth a crap. The instruction manual for the NVIDIA Shield is literally three illustrations one plugging in the power one plugging in the hdmi and one pressing the on button to start that's it everything else you have to google you have to look it up online and a lot of the information is outdated there are two versions of the nvidia shield and both have gone through a lot of changes to the os and how things work especially in the setting screens over the years so what I found was a lot of discrepancies. Even in the on-screen help, they haven't fully updated how things work or what the menus look like, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this is the major difference. If you want an appliance, you wanna plug it in, turn it on, and just use it and be confident that it's gonna work 100% of the time, you get the Apple, period. There is no comparison. If you are a techie person and you are comfortable with figuring out that, oh, I need to reboot or, oh, this might need an update or, oh, there might be a setting for this here or maybe over here. Mm, maybe I can tweak this or that. Maybe there's another app I can install that does this better. Then you're okay with the Android. But I would never in my life give the Android to somebody that's a non-techie. My parents could use the Apple TV. They wouldn't know what in the world to do with the Android out of the box. Okay, that's a big difference. Anybody that has both, I don't think you would ever argue with that statement. So the Apple TV appliance, NVIDIA Shield, cool tech toy. I think that pretty much leaves it succinct. Okay, so let's take a look and see how Atmos is working for us. So we are currently in the Apple TV, and if I use my voice commands to turn on the TV, it defaults to the Apple TV, simply because we are using this for everything except playing Atmos, which is obviously a lot of other stuff. Now, what I just did is started my activity for the NVIDIA Shield, which will switch the input on the receiver, turn off the Apple, turn on the Shield, etc cetera, etc cetera. and i'll go through how this happens because it's not very intuitive on the harmony to get it working right so this is plex right in here and it just uh, brings up wherever i left off i was demoing bohemian rhapsody during the concert scene for some friends yesterday so this is plex and that's this is what the interface looks like again identical uh, between the Apple and the Shield, both work absolutely beautifully. So we'll go back to the home screen right here, and this is how I have it customized. Again, not nearly as clean looking as it is out of the box, and all I have installed right now is Plex. And what you get here is the top row would be everything that I have installed. If I have more apps installed, they would just be listed here. And that's pretty much like what the Apple TV looks like. You just get boxes of all your different apps. And if you want to install more, you can just go right here. It's the same as the Apple Store where you can install stuff. So a lot of these here, they're actually installed. You can't uninstall them. But what you can is pin or not pin them. So Netflix is installed. I can't get rid of it because it, they don't let you. But if I wanted it to show up on the home screen, I just add it to favorites 
and now it's there on the home screen. So pretty much the same as Apple TV, except you can't get rid of stuff, and it's not a big deal unless you're really short on local storage. I don't really install that much, so I just have the basic 16 gig uh, NVIDIA Shield. You can get the, a much larger one. Now the one cool thing is you can expand the storage by just plugging in an SSD or an external hard drive to the USB ports on the back of the Shield. And you can't do that with Apple. There is no expansion on the Apple. So that is a really, really cool bonus. Like I said, this is a tech toy. There is a whole lot of stuff you can do. You can even run a Plex server on this. So you don't need a computer. You can just plug in an external hard drive and serve your movies direct. I don't even think you need uh, to run the Plex server. I think you can basically install something like Kodi and just use the external hard drive. But anyway, I like Plex a lot better than Kodi for this. Kodi had a lot more uh, buffering and delays, even on Ethernet, and it's not as polished an uh, interface. Plex has a great interface. So we'll go into Plex, and it's quick, everything's instant. We're totally on Wi-Fi, by the way. Now, what I've done is I've named anything in Atmos with the word Atmos. I haven't named these here yet. These are from the actual uh, Atmos demo disc last year's. And those are just great, you know, basically, well, here's a, here's a full Blu-ray. Uh, great demos for anybody, right? But movies that are in Atmos, I just added the word Atmos. That way I can search and it will come up and all I have to type in is Atmos. Neither the Apple TV nor the Shield really support uh, searchable metadata. You have to put it in the title. Not a huge deal. But anyway, all I'm using this for is streaming anything with Atmos. Everything else is slightly better going through the Apple TV 4K just because it's an easier interface. Both look the same, uh, both sound the same. These are both playing the uncompressed uh, soundtracks and both are playing HDR10. The Apple TV 4K, however, can do Dolby Vision while the Shield cannot. I can't say I notice a huge difference between the two. If you've only got HDR10 and not Dolby Vision, do not spend a dime trying to get Dolby Vision. It's hardly noticeable. Okay, so Mission Impossible Fallout here was one that was not playing correctly. And I would play it, and like I said, after about a minute and a half, it was failing. So right now, it plays fine, and you can see it plays instantly. This is a full Blu-ray rip at 47 megabits a second. So <laughs> no problems. The Atmos itself really depends on the content. This is, uh, I have, I've got mixed feelings about it, okay? When it works, it really works. The concert scene in Bohemian Rhapsody, it's like you are in the, in the stadium. I mean, I'm not kidding. The, the atmospheric sound is exactly what they were going for. You hear the people all over you. It's just enveloping your sound space. They did a great job. Um, other game, uh, not games, other movies are using it for effects more than atmosphere. For example, bullets going overhead, explosions, helicopters, and that kind of thing. Most movies I found are using it really sparingly. And you might think it's not even on. It's just so sparse. Then you have uh, these like documentaries that are using it for much more effect, but again, more subtle. Like this Flight of the Bumble Butterflies. The opening scenes of it, you get this uh, sensation like they're flying all around you. Uh, some movies are using sound effects for rain, so it, it sounds like there's rain on the roof overhead, that kind of thing. Some use it way more than others. Action movies are definitely using it more. Uh, Fallout has a, a lot of use, uh, not only for effects like 
vehicles. Um, but things falling, um, the ambience of being inside a room, that really uses it well. Suicide Squad has a ton of explosions and action effects and, and all kinds of stuff. But by far, like not even close to anything else, are all the Dolby demos for Atmos. They are just insane. I mean, they're using the speakers specifically to show you, hey, here's where sound can come from, right? And it just goes all over the room, left, right, up, down, and it doesn't stop. So if you have an Atmos system and you want to demo it for people, you need to use the Dolby demos. So the other big thing is, if you're not streaming local content, forget about it. Do not spend a penny on it. Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime video streaming services have Atmos support and they are absolutely worthless. Uh, Netflix has way more than um, Amazon Prime and I found a handful, just a handful of things that you could even tell it was working. And they're things like the Netflix produced series. The movies themselves, absolutely useless. All the sound you're getting through Netflix is highly compressed. And there is a gigantic difference on a good system between the compressed Dolby Digital and the uncompressed Dolby True HD. It is not even remotely close. So you must be streaming or playing local content to get anywhere near the full Atmos experience. That is absolutely paramount. Okay, now let me show you how to set up your Harmony system if you want to do the kind of integration I did. So here's how I have everything set up. I have the Harmony remote itself. This is a home screen. I have two what are called activities set up. An activity is something where you can press these. These are both touchscreen activities on the remote itself. And they set in motion a whole series of sequences. What I wanted to be able to do was just toggle between watching the Apple TV and watching the Shield TV and setting everything up. You can see that it's also fully controllable from your tablet or phone through the Harmony app. And now I'm running the Shield TV activity. Here's why you want to do it that way. Because when you're in a particular activity, all the buttons on the physical remote remap to whatever you want. So when I'm watching the Shield TV, obviously I want the buttons on the remote to control the Shield TV. If, for example, I'm watching the Apple TV, I need all the buttons on the remote to control the Apple TV because that's what I'm watching. And you can only do that by setting up these activities. I wish there was another way to do it. I wish that you could use these touch panel buttons to just, for example, switch the input on a receiver and remap the buttons, but it doesn't work that way. So here's what you need to do to do such a transition. First of all, go into the app. The remote really isn't used much at all for altering or creating sequences. It's a pain in the butt. So just pick this up when you're ready to actually use things. In the app, this is the home screen for it. You get a list of uh, all your devices that you have hooked up to it. I've got my receiver, my TV, my smart plugs controlling the cooling fan, my Apple TV, and the NVIDIA Shield. And if I want to control any one of those individually, I can do so, and then all of its controls are instantly available. So I don't need any of these individual remotes. All I need is my phone or tablet. But that's not what we're doing not what we're doing today. So what we want is edit activities. And we're gonna create a new one here like I would be doing the Shield TV, for example. If you've only got one activity, it's pretty simple. I always do the add your own activity because if you do the suggested, what it's basically doing is 
it sees a list of what you've added to the system and it thinks it knows what you want to do. So it suggests using the TV, the receiver, and the NVIDIA Shield to create one called Shield TV, which is actually what I wanted to do, but you don't want to do that in all cases. So I do add your own, and now you can just do whatever you want. So you can call it whatever you want. There's a little bug here, by the way. We'll call it TV2. For example, if you want to pick an icon, you can scroll here and you know, say you want to pick this one here. Well, your next button goes away because they tied the next button to this back plane of icons and it scrolls with it. Just kind of buggy. This program has some major bugs or a bunch of them that will instantly crash the app. Now, remember I said Apple kind of vets their programs? Well, they don't always get it right. <laughs> this one has bugs. So we'll just create a fake activity here. Next, you get to choose what in your system do you want involved with this activity? If you need to do anything with the device in this activity, you need to pick it here. And this is what kind of sucks because you can't add or remove something later on. So if you make a mistake and, oh, you know, I, I forgot to, uh, you know, put in whatever device, you got to scrap it. You got to delete the activity and start all the way over. You can't ever change this. It's baked in. It's really dumb. So we're going to use the receiver and the TV and the shield and the cooling fan and the Apple TV. Okay. So activity type, this is like, a preset of what it's going to be doing doesn't really mean anything we're just going to pick that so now what do you want to do with this particular device this is where it gets hairy the problem i faced when i first tried this was i would be watching the apple tv and i would click shield tv and it would be powering off my receiver because <laughs> this is really dumb by default if you switch to a different activity and the device is no longer used in the new activity, remember on that list, it turns it off. Doesn't leave it alone, just turns it off. So I just wanted to turn on the shield, leave everything else alone and switch the input on the receiver. Well, it didn't like that and it automatically puts in this command to turn off the receiver and I'll show you exactly where you can turn that off in here. What you have to do is go to Harmony Setup, Edit Devices. Now say, for example, you want your receiver to stay on switching activities, which you do. <laughs> Here's where you have to go. By default, it, like I said, turns off automatically. You do not want that. And yes, it goes through this firmware checking a lot. So I'll show you, for example, how to change that on the TV. Right now I've got it controlled by the CEC, but say for example, I wanted the TV to always stay on switching between activities. We would go into devices, TV, and then down here, power settings. Now by default, everything you add is always turn off when not in use. But what you want is keep device always on, but switch off when off button is pressed. So your devices will stay on until you specifically in an activity, tell it to turn off. That's what we want. Now you'd think that would be the end of it. No, it is far more complicated than that. The next screen is basically asking, do you have a single power button? So you press it once, it turns on, press it again, it turns off. Or do you have a dedicated set of commands or buttons for on and off? That's what you want is using two different buttons because there is a specific off command that we have to use. So we're gonna select that and then we're gonna select next. Pay attention to the next and back because these are what really trip you up. So we're gonna go next. Now it's asking, well, you gotta map those two commands, those power on and off commands. So we're gonna start with power on, and we're gonna map that 
to the command power on. We have to click add step, pick a command, and then scroll down and find power on and off. And yes, they've switched power on and off, don't know why. Select power on, next, next, there we go. Okay, notice there's no more next button. You would think there would be, okay, and now I wanna do the next one. No, you have to now go back and remember that you haven't yet done power off. If you don't do everything on this list, this will fail, but it won't tell you it'll fail. It just won't work. And it'll default back to power off if not used. And you'll be scratching your head like I was. Now you gotta remember, finish the list. Do the same thing with power off. Add step, assign a command, power off command, next. And back to this screen, we have to go back again, back to here. Now we can press next. and it finally saves the power settings for that particular device. So now the TV will stay on switching between commands. It first saves it in the activity to, uh, to every activity that uses the device and the next time you pick up the remote, it will sync the remote with those changes that it just made. Anytime you make a change to your, your list of activities or your remote mappings or anything like that, the remote, the physical remote will sync the next time it communicates with the hub. And now it's good to go. Now I can switch between the two and the TV stays on until I press the off button. You have to do that for every kind of device that is needing to stay on, like the receiver. Um, just switching between these two, all I wanted to do is switch between my scenes, my inputs. I don't want the receiver to power off just because I've switched inputs. <laughs> it's not intuitive, but that's how you do it. So anyway, hope this helps somebody. Once you get it working, it really is fantastic. And I do suggest it if you have local media. If not, don't spend a penny on Atmos, but it's cool. See you guys next time.